Welcome to today's webinar, which is all about building confidence and managing anxiety in your child. Um, my name is not Francesca Weber, I'm actually Abby Roden, um, and I am a child wellbeing practitioner from First Steps. And my name is Shakira, um, Shakira John. So that I am a CWP, so a children's wellbeing practitioner also at First Steps. Um, so just to let you know that we are going to be recording today's session, um, but all of your cameras are off and your microphones are muted and your names will not be shown to anybody who's attending. Um, so we'll be the only people who are seen on the screen. And um, also please feel free to ask any questions that you might have throughout the webinar today. There should be a question function um, on the side of your screen. We won't have time to answer the questions during the webinar, but we will um, be looking at those at the end. Um, but if you have any difficulties, we will be keeping an eye on it. So just pop them in there if you do. Um, so just to kind of talk a little bit about the aims of today. Um, the webinar is going to be delivered over two weeks. So the first session today aims to help you understand what anxiety in children looks like, um, to explore factors involved in the development and maintenance of anxiety in children, and to really briefly introduce strategies for managing anxiety in children, which will be the main focus of our session next week. Um, so just before we begin, we really wanted to quickly highlight the current situation that we've found ourselves in due to COVID-19 and the understandable difficulties that it has brought with it. Um, we've all had to adjust our lives many times over the year with the situation constantly changing and being full of uncertainty. We've changed up our routines completely. Some families have had to become teachers for their children while also managing working from home, worries about health and well-being of ourselves, but also those around us, and also being in complete lockdown in our homes. It's been a really, really difficult time for many families, and however you and your family are coping and feeling is completely valid and completely understandable. But while the pandemic is completely new, a new experience for everybody, the difficulties and those kind of challenging emotions and feelings that it brought with it, they're not new and there are lots of ways that we know we can manage and cope with these. And we're hoping to share some of those and cover that with you in our webinar um, this week and next week. Okay, so we are really quickly gonna just do a video which um, kind of summarizes what anxiety is and it's just kind of a little introduction um, for you know that scared or nervous feeling you get when you have to do something you're not sure you can do or go somewhere you've never been before that feeling is called anxiety and it can feel a bit different for each person but it usually doesn't feel very nice Maybe your palms get sweaty, or your body tenses up, or maybe you get a tummy ache. Maybe you've heard of anxiety, or maybe you haven't, but you've definitely felt it before. Because everyone feels it sometimes, it's normal. You wanna know something really weird about anxiety? It's actually trying to help you. It's true. All those uncomfortable feelings, those happen because your brain thinks you're in danger and it wants to protect you. When our muscles tense up and we sweat, it gets us ready to do a lot of exercise, which is helpful if you need to jump out of the way of a runaway train or wrestle a Wolverine. Sometimes our minds go blank and we feel like we can't move or talk. That would be great if we needed to hide. Instead, we just feel stuck. When your brain does this, it's called fight, flight or freeze. The problem is sometimes your brain gets confused and it can't tell the difference between a charging moose and say going to a new school. Both things can be scary and cause anxiety but there aren't any dangerous wild animals at a new school hopefully. Understanding where anxiety comes from is the first step in learning to deal with it. 
So the next time you're in one of those tough situations and you start to feel those feelings like butterflies in your stomach or sweaty palms, or it gets hard to talk or move, remember, there's nothing wrong with your body. You're just having normal feelings of anxiety and they're actually trying to help, even if they're not very good at it sometimes. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, so as mentioned in the video, everybody experiences anxiety, both children and adults alike. Um, um, we want you now to consider this question. So how do you see anxiety in your child? So how might you know when your child is anxious? And what does it look like in terms of what they might say or what they might do? And this is likely really different for all children. We've seen families whose children might become more clingy or restless, and they might complain of stomach aches or headaches. Some children might start having tantrums. So have a little think about how you might um, know when your child is anxious. Um, so we tend to think of anxiety as involving the three areas um, on this slide. So firstly, a thought and an expectation that something bad is going to happen. And typically thoughts become focused on potential threats and how to escape from it. And it can be really hard to think about anything else. So this is actually really useful when someone is actually in danger. So for example, if a car is speeding towards you, um, you want your mind to be focused on the car as opposed to the shoes that maybe someone's wearing on the other side of the road. Um, so those are kind of the thoughts. Um, next, there's also a particular way by which our body responds to anxiety, as we saw in the video. And these physical sensations are normal responses to anxious thoughts, um, triggered by the fight, flight, and freeze response. And these feelings include um, our breathing getting faster, our heart rates increasing, our muscles becoming tense, butterflies in our stomach, and children might also complain of tummy aches and headaches, needing to go to the toilet. I'm sure you can have a think if your child has ever mentioned any of these to you at times when um, they might have had a thought um, of anxiety in their minds. Um, and I like to think of the fight, flight, freeze response as a bit like our brain sending a text message down to our body and saying, there's danger, we need to prepare. And that danger could be a car speeding towards us, but it also could be just doing a test at school. Um, our body still responds in the same way. And the third characteristic is that there's certain behaviors that children do when they're anxious. And this includes anything that they might do to help anticipate or avoid the danger, such as seeking lots and lots of reassurance from parents, or maybe resisting or avoiding the situation that they're a bit worried about. Um, so just to kind of summarize that, when we're anxious, we tend to have anxious expectations in our minds, um, anxious bodily responses, and also we're likely to engage in anxious um, behaviors as well. And it's also really important to know that children's feelings can present in lots and lots of different ways. And we tend to think of their behavior as being at the tip of an iceberg, which we can all see. And the feelings and the thoughts are hidden under the water. So take an example of a child who might be refusing to do their homework. They might argue with you or ignore your request for them to get on with it. And they might avoid doing that homework. And the behavior that you can see is their anger and their avoidance. But that might be being driven by thoughts and feelings such as maybe not being able to do the work correctly and maybe some low confidence or maybe getting something wrong and getting in trouble with their teacher. So it's really important that we're kind of aware of this iceberg idea. Um, and this table is just to kind of give you a brief overview about developmental stages of children and what we might expect to see worries and anxiety about at each stage. It's really important to remember that this is just a general idea and it's not, um, it's not don't get too caught up in these stages because every child is different. Um, so at different ages, 
um, children tend to worry about different things. And um, the worry is linked partly to the development of their brain and partly to other aspects of their life stage. So for example, if you look at 12 to 18 year olds, we tend to see an increased importance in the peer group. And so there tends to be an increase in worries about social situations and maybe the world, um, the world issues around them. Um, so as previously mentioned, we all experience anxiety and it is a very, very normal part of life. But there are a few things to consider when we're trying to work out whether or not your child's anxiety has become a problem. Um, things to consider might include if the worries continue to occur when a danger has passed, or in fact, when there was no danger at all. Um, also, is it a normal response to something happening in their lives? For example, if they're starting a new school, um, how strong is the worry and is it hard for them to manage with it? Um, so, for example, is it stopping them from doing what they should be doing or what you should be doing as a family or as a parent? The three kind of areas that we tend to focus on when we're considering the impact of a child's anxiety is their academic achievement, um, their social lives and their relationship with their friends um, or their mood. So, are they feeling really miserable or low as a result? So we'll now ask you to kind of reflect on the biggest problem that you think is um, being caused by your child's anxiety and consider the ways in which it, it might be impacting on their life or your family's life. And we'll give you some time to think this through. Um, just have a little think. We, we've seen lots of families who report that their child had to maybe miss out on a school day because they have a tummy ache. Um, some families that we work with um, will say that they are too worried, their child's too worried to go and play at a friend's house because they don't want to leave their parents. Um, so anxiety and worry can be really exhausting and they can lead your child to miss out on doing things that they would otherwise enjoy. Um, but a normal amount of fear and worry is normal. So the goal is not to get your child to a place where they never worry at all, but instead it's to, our aim is to assist you in helping your child to take control of their fears and worries. And so that it doesn't stop them from getting the most out of their life. And it kind of doesn't impact on those three areas as much. So we see, we see different types of anxiety in children where the focus of the worry is slightly different. Um, all children will experience fears and worries in different ways and it's important for you to think about your child's own unique experience of that. Um, so we tend to group anxiety problems together based on specific features which have been given the labels that you see on the screen here. Um, the most common patterns of anxiety in children um, are these ones on the screen. And most of the time, these difficulties go hand in hand. Um, and in fact, seeing a child who has just one of these is the exception rather than the rule. Um, so generalized anxiety might refer to a child who is a bit of a worrier. And you might reassure them about one thing that they're worried about. And then they might find that they start worrying about something else. Um, with other children, the worry might be a bit more focused on one or two areas. So some might worry about separating from their parents um, or carers or from home. Some might worry about being evaluated negatively in social situations, um, such as kind of speaking in front of their class. Some might have a specific phobia of an object or a thing or a situation. Some might have um, obsessive compulsive disorder, which refers to an obsession or a compulsion to repeat a certain behavior or a ritual. Um, or some might have panic, which refers to those kind of panic attacks in any number of situations without a warning. Okay, so many parents normally wonder about what has actually caused anxiety in their child. And some worry that they might have contributed to it in some way or worry that they may have done something wrong. While parents can influence anxious, um, how anxious their child is, 
it's rare that children's worries are caused by just one problem in particular. So there are usually a number of factors that play a role and a variety of influences. So one of these factors is genes. We know that anxiety runs in family and research has shown that about a third of what makes a child anxious is explained by genes. So in simple terms, anxiety is explained by one part genes and two parts environment. Also, children inherit particular characteristics, not anxiety per se, but characteristics such as sensitivity. You are likely to feel that many of the ways your child responds to things resembles how you or others in your family respond. The other factors are more to do with the child's environment, which explains why your child may have brothers or sisters who do not appear to be anxious in the least. The experiences that the child has in their life have a crucial influence on how fears and worries develop. Children might experience a particular adverse life event or something stressful that may have impacted their anxiety. Okay, it, is, it has also been suggested that what the child learns from those around them may contribute to anxiety. We know that children develop from watching other people around them. Children really rely heavily on information they get from observing parents or carers and siblings, and they're likely to use your behaviors as a way to work out whether they should be anxious themselves. So research actually shows that children with anxiety pay particularly close attention to the reactions of people around them and are more influenced by this they are extremely good at picking up on subtle signs that something is wrong. And you might have noticed that about your child. So for example, uh, let's say you're scared of dogs. You might try to contain your fear in front of your child, but you might cross the road every time you see a dog. What this does is it teaches your child a message that dogs are dangerous, I must avoid them. And that's how they can learn that behavior. Anxious children are also on the lookout for how people respond to what they do. It is really like, it is really common that parents or children with anxiety will show concern about how their child will cope if they're prone to anxiety. And of course, they're gonna to want to do their best to prevent them from becoming distressed. Parents might try to reduce their child's distress, such as unintentionally encouraging them to avoid their fears, stepping in to sort out problems for their child or giving lots and lots of reassurance. It may also be seen in very subtle non-verbal communication, such as if a child is stroking a dog, are the parents relaxed or are they concerned and tense? All of these are completely natural responses and parents are designed to want to protect their child in this way. But these reactions may suggest to the child that something bad is about to happen or that the parent has a lack of confidence in their ability to cope. So I just want to reiterate and highlight once again, it's completely natural to want to respond in, in such a way you, you want to protect your child, it's natural. But these reactions can actually maybe teach the child that you have a lack of confidence in their ability or that something bad will happen. So it's helpful to think about um, all of those things that might have caused anxiety, but it's actually not essential. And um, what's important now is to understand what's maintaining your child's anxiety. So we think of it like a car stuck in the mud. Um, we want to sort out what is stopping the car from moving on. And this is much more helpful than dwelling on what might have got us stuck there in the first place. So what keeps anxiety going? There are two common maintenance anxiety cycles in anxiety. Um, so the first one that we're going to talk about is um, the things that children do. And the second thing is what people around them try 
to do to kind of help them that actually might keep it going. So previously we talked about how thoughts, feelings and behaviours are all three areas which play a really key role in making up anxiety, but they also play a key role in maintaining it. And it's useful to see how these all fit together. And this is what we call a vicious cycle of anxiety, um, which is illustrated here. So as we previously discussed, um, when we're faced with a danger, our thoughts tend to be focused on the danger. So they tend to involve an overestimation that something bad will happen. For example, they might worry that they'll do badly in a test. Um, and then anxious thoughts also tend to involve a lack of ability to cope with that danger. So, for example, your child might be worried about failing that test. Then they might predict that during the test, they'll have a panic, give up, and then they'll start crying. Um, and thinking in this way can get in the way of new learning, as it can be really common that children are then particularly attuned to noticing and remembering information around them that confirms that there's a danger and they may start to filter out information that says otherwise. Um, and naturally, these anxious thoughts and expectations um, then lead to physical feelings of anxiety, which um, we've talked about quite a bit. So that those kind of fight, fight, freeze responses. Um, and these physical feelings can be really unpleasant and really uncomfortable. And the child might even come to fear those physical reactions themselves. Um, and they also might confirm to the child that the situation is dangerous and that um, it should be avoided. Um, and children then act in a really understandable way to get rid of all of those anxious thoughts and feelings. Um, and they might avoid the situation that they're worried about, or they might engage in what we call safety seeking behaviors. So that might include seeking lots and lots of reassurance from their parents or carers um, just before they um, kind of have a fear that happen. Um, and while avoidance and safety seeking behaviours are really helpful in making us feel better in the short term, in the long term, the child then doesn't learn the important new information that they might need to learn um, that could break them out of this negative cycle. So, for example, if your child avoids going to football because he's worried about not performing well, um, that child then doesn't learn that it might not be as bad as they thought, or maybe they could cope if it was as bad as they thought, um, or maybe if they constantly seek reassurance from you before going to bed at night time, that child doesn't learn that they can manage without the reassurance and that they don't have an opportunity to kind of develop the coping skills to manage on their own. Um, so it's really, really helpful for you to think about your child and how their own cycle of anxiety, what might that look like in terms of the thoughts, the feelings and behaviours and what might be keeping them stuck in that cycle. And just to kind of take you through an example to kind of illustrate this. So, for example, a child who is anxious about going to bed in their room on their own. So they might have lots and lots of worries in their mind about a burglar being in the room, and they might believe that their parent might not be able to hear them calling for help. Um, understandably, this makes them feel nervous and worried and scared. They then might get physical sensations such as tummy aches, headaches, heart pacing, jitters. And in response, they might behave by procrastinating bedtime. They might resist going upstairs on their own and they might you know, start playing around, um, or they might ask their parents to stay with them until they fall asleep. Um, and that child will then believe that everything was okay because they have their parents with them. Um, and they'll continue to depend on that the next time they go to their room and the next time. And then that kind of starts the vicious cycle going round and round. Okay, so now to continue thinking about what maintains anxiety, we're going to think about what others do. And uh, we're actually going to watch a clip now from one of my favourite movies, Finding Nemo. Um, and we want to invite you all to consider a few things. So what do you notice about the clip? 
what does Nemo do? What does his dad Marlin do? What are some of the helpful things? Maybe some of the unhelpful things. And why do you think dad Marlin uh, behaves the way he does? So have these things in mind just as we switch over to watch the clip now. All right, where's the brake? You feel a brake? Sometimes you can't tell because fluid is rushing into the area. Now, any rushing fluid? Are you losing? How many stripes do I have? Three. Answer the stripe question. Three. No, see, something's wrong with you. I have one, two, three. That's all I have. Oh, you're okay. How's the lucky fin? Lucky. Let's see. <laughs> Are you sure you want to go to school this year? Because there's no problem if you don't. You can wait five or six years. Come on, Dad. It's time for school. Uh uh, uh forgot to brush. Oh. Do you want this anemone to sting you? Yes. Brush. <sighs> okay, I'm done. Oh, you missed a spot. There. There. <laughs> <laughs> there. There. First day of school, here we go. We're ready to learn to get some knowledge. Now, what's the one thing we have to remember about the ocean? Smart sea. That's my boy. So, first, we check to see that the coast is clear. We go out and back in. And then we go out and back in. And then one more time, out and back in. And sometimes, if you want to do it four times, yeah. all right, come on, boy. Dad, yeah, maybe while I'm at school, I'll see a shark. I highly doubt that. Have you ever met a shark? No, and I don't plan to. Oh, well, there's sea turtles. Sea turtles? I don't know. Timmy Plankton from next door, he said that sea turtles said that they live to be about 100 years old. Well, you know what? If I ever meet a sea turtle, I'll ask. After I'm done talking to the shark, okay? Whoa, 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 hold on. Hold on, wait to cross. Hold my fin. Hold my fin. Dad, you're not going to freak out like you did at the petting zoo, are you? The duck snail was about to charge. Hmm, I wonder where we're supposed to go. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, thank you, Abby. So hopefully you were able to hear that all right. Um, I've seen this clip so many times and I still find it hilarious. And hopefully, you know, you're able to maybe spot some different behaviors that dad um, actually, you know, did that probably contributed to the maintenance of anxiety. Um, Nemo seemed super relaxed. However, for example, when Nemo got sucked into that thing, so I don't know what that is, dad was like, where's the break? Where's the break? Um, so that anxious reaction right there, instead of saying, you know, are you okay? Or you know, helping or just, where's the break, where's the break, or even giving the child the chance or Nemo the chance to get up by himself. So it was that anxious reaction or, you know, there's something wrong with you. How many stripes do I have? That anxiety there or um, when they were crossing the, the road, they're like, hold my fin, hold my fin. So these different kind of reactions there, whereas, you know, in, um, Nemo didn't, didn't really display a lot of anxiety. It is possible that if we as parents are behaving like that to our children, um, they, they're going to pick up on that and it could cause them to fear things that they originally weren't fearful of. Okay, so the way other people respond can make a difference for a child's vicious cycle. Previously, we talked about how learning by example and watching others' reactions can contribute towards anxiety, but actually they can also keep it going. So by demonstrating anxious behaviors, as Marlon did, reacting to the child in an anxious way, becoming very involved or protective and providing lots of reassurance, parents can inadvertently confirm their child's anxious thoughts to be true regarding the danger and a lack of coping skills. It also does not encourage them, the child, to test out or try new things, which means that they will not get the information that they need to test out their fear, beliefs, or develop the skills they need to become able to deal with challenges independently. So ultimately, the aim is to help your child to break out of their vicious cycle. Specifically, we want to support and guide you through ways to work out what your child needs to learn, the most helpful way to respond to their worries, 
and to work with your child to help put their fears to the test. The first step to doing this is to understand anxiety and next week we'll focus on the next step. Okay, so next week, this is a snapshot into what we'll be covering next week. These are the, um, the strategies that we'll be discussing and talking about. So including helpful ways to respond to your child through something called containment, uh, tips on educating your child on anxiety, how to help your child recognize and stand up to anxious thoughts, ways to encourage brave behavior and testing out anxious expectations, developing skills and problem solving, ways to promote and build independence, to help your child manage their big worries through mindfulness and relaxation exercises, and also to think about ways that you can look after yourselves and manage your own worries. Okay, so essentially wrapping up um, from, from today, before we meet again next week, um, it'd be really great if you could spend some time just thinking about what strategies you already use to manage your child's anxiety, thinking about what works and, and what might not be so helpful. And also just a suggestion, a really useful resource um, there's actually this book that you can see on the screen. So it's Helping Your Child with Fears and Worries, a guided self-help guide for parents. It's full of really useful information similar to what we've talked about today. Uh, we actually got a lot of the information that we spoke about today from this book. So it is recommended reading. If you want to purchase it, it's really helpful. Um, you can buy it online, I think maybe five, six pounds. Okay, and essentially that's it for today. So we spent today really just kind of helping provide that education on what anxiety is, what causes it, what keeps it going. Um, hopefully this is um, a bit of a teaser for you to encourage you to come back next week where we actually discuss what those you know practical steps are that we spoke about um, earlier. So now, I don't know, Abby, if you have anything to add before we go over to the questions? No, I think that was, that's good. Can see there's some questions there. Yes, um, I saw a question earlier um, about chandeliering. So when um, on one of Abby's slides that she was talking about the um, the iceberg, uh, where it was showing like the different kind of behaviors, one of the words on there was um, chandeliering. So somebody asked, "What is chandeliering?" And that's just a term um, that talks about somebody who's seemingly calm, so maybe your child is normally really calm, and suddenly they're like flying off the handle for no reason, but for no reason that you that you know, and normally what it is is they've, you know, slowly been pushed to the limit, but that's what it is, it's them acting completely out of character, flying off the hinges, but normally they're quite calm, that's what that term means. Um, um, somebody is asking, um that we showed and um, we will be sharing all of the kind of materials that we um have shared today we're going to be sending out a pack with all of the information the slides um and all the videos as well um, and the name of the book as well and um, so we'll send that out to you um i've noticed another one has asked the question is what if your child does understand that they have doesn't understand that they have anxiety or they can't explain what is worrying them and um, that is really 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 common and we see that a lot with children um, and sometimes they might even say one thing one day and the next day they might say another thing um, and that's actually something that we're really going to focus on next week is just really understanding kind of what how to ask the questions to kind of really understand what's going on inside your child's mind um because a lot of the time they don't even understand themselves and it's about kind of being really patient with that and um maybe um kind of being a bit of a guide for them as well and um, but as i said that's really going to be the focus next week i don't know if you have anything to add Shira. no yeah it's going to be the focus of, of next week and we're going to um I think what can be really helpful is if the child actually has the language to be able to explain 
what they're, they're, they're feeling. And sometimes we don't realize that they don't have that in terms of they might not know how to label the emotions, that what they're feeling. So next week when we talk about that, we'll, we'll talk about the importance of being able to name these feelings and um, emotions. I think that's all the questions. Yeah, seeing lots of thank yous. Thank you all for being here. Um, oh, I see another question. Um, as the webinar is recorded, will we be able to watch this another, another time you send it to us? Um, yes, we're hoping to be able to make it available on YouTube. Um, so the link will be sent out um, for you to be able to watch it. Okay. And if there are no other questions, you're free to go. Um, thank you all so much. And we look forward to welcoming you back at the same time next week.